Good morning. It is a joy to be with you today. I am Jessica Margrave Sharm. I would like to think that I'm a familiar face, but I think I've preached all but two Sundays someplace else since Easter. So it's been a long time since we've seen each other. Um, so it's a, a gift to be back with you today, and um, I'm grateful to step in while Pastor Steve and Sophie are on vacation. Um, And I would like to just draw your attention to this whole long list of announcements. So many, so many wonderful opportunities to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community and throughout the world. So I encourage you to find ways to participate if you can. Also, pay close attention um, to the notes about Steve and Sophie being gone because there's some important phone numbers there should you have a pastoral care need in their absence. Um, maybe keep this paper close by so you know who to reach out to. Are there any other announcements that we need to bring to attention before we prepare our hearts? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you for that. That ties right in with our sermon theme for today. So, um, any other announcements? Well, we do, in addition to, I'm not a special guest, but being a guest preacher today, we also have some wonderful guest musicians today, so please pay close attention, and I think there's information about them here in the in the bulletin, but I, I heard them practicing a little bit, and it's really a treat for our spirits, so... Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship that we are about to enter into. And I invite you to read responsively with me our call to worship. God of life and love. God of all peoples and all places. God of the earth and the heavens. You visit the earth and water it. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. God of life and love.
the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. The divine gardener cannot sow seeds of justice and peace where there is nothing but hearts of dry, hard rocks. We confess that our hearts may need tilling and the digging out of the deeply rooted sins that crowd out seedlings planted with divine compassion. God of steadfast love, you change bitter tears of remorseful hearts with raindrops of earth. Now let us germinate a new life growing with integrity. God of steadfast love, you change the cold shame of contrite hearts with sun rays of mercy. Now let us sprout a new life growing with honesty. God of steadfast love, you change the stony edges of repentant hearts into landscapes of mercy. Now let us branch out into new life, growing with generosity. of assurance. Divine Gardener, you tend us in steadfast love, unending mercies and eternal faithfulness. You cultivate true friendship with us through boundless forgiveness. In Christ, this faithful love is planted in our hearts. Gathered as your community of believers, our family of faith, with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us, may we now produce forgiveness for each other as we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And thanks be to God for giving us his law, which guides us day by day. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Thank you. 
Thank you for that special music. And at this time, I'd invite our children and young folk. And hey, if you're young at heart and want to walk around, come up and join us for children's time. Yeah, you're filled with the spirit today, aren't you? I can tell, right? Hey, I have a couple pictures that I want to show you. Yesterday, I went for a walk around my yard, and I took some pictures of things, and I want you to help me just describe for all of these folks out there who won't see these pictures what's going on in this one, okay? There's four of them. So here's the first one. What's going on in that picture? There's a crack. Yeah, there's cr- a crack. It's a rock. It's a rock that is cracked. Uh-huh. And and there is there is a weed growing out. That's right. So there's a cro- uh, a crack in the rock and there's some weeds or some plants or grass or something growing in that. Right? Have you seen that before? Mm -hmm. This is my driveway. (laughs) I need to buy some Roundup. But we haven't done that yet. And so there's cracks in the driveway, and there's these plants that thought, hey, this crack looks like a great place to grow. Have you seen plants growing in cracks and in sidewalks and in rocks before? I have a yard full of Yeah. Yeah, me too. I love it. All right, tell me what's happening in this picture. There's grass and weeds. Grass and weeds. Is there a lot of grass or just... It's wood wood chips, but like like less grass and more are dirt. Right. Yeah, so this is a place where there's more grass growing than what was in the cracks, right? But mostly what you see is like dirt and sticks, and it's not very beautiful, right? This is a part of our yard where we just can't get grass to grow. It's just dirt, and it stays dry, and my husband forgets to mow it all the time, and it, uh, it's just that part that just won't grow. I bet you all have a place in your yard like that, too. I don't. Oh, I need to talk to your parents. Yeah, yeah my, my weeds are actually growing in my garden because there's better soil in my garden than, than in urban grass is where it's supposed to grow. Right, exactly. That is a perfect intro to this next picture. What do you see happening in this picture? The grass is growing. There's lots of things growing there, isn't there? Yeah, is it pretty? No, not really. I mean, what is it just? There's leaves, lots and lots of leaves. Weeds, right? Like just a jungle of weeds happening in this picture. Yeah. So it looks like maybe this is a good place for things to grow, right? But all that's really growing there is just weeds. Not, Not any pretty flowers, no fruits or vegetables, no nice grass, just lots of weeds. What's happening in this picture? 
flowers, right? It's a flower pot. And there's actually like some healthy looking things growing there, right? See, I'm not a total failure, right? There's leaves on it and some pretty white flowers. And so in this pot, I worked really hard to grow these flowers. I put special dirt in there, and I got special plants, and I water it with special plant food. And it kind of takes a lot of work to keep these things alive. So in all of these pictures, something is in common. What do all of these pictures have in common? Leaves, right? Weeds, <laughs> yeah. Leaves. Plants. plants. Something is growing in all of these places, right? From things that maybe aren't that great to things that are really beautiful, but in all of these places, something is growing. Today we're going to hear this story that Jesus told his followers, and he tells about all different kinds of soil. And he says, if you're planting seeds, sometimes your seeds fall on rocky ground. Sometimes your seeds fall on dry ground where there's not enough water for them to grow. Sometimes your seeds fall in healthy places, but the weeds grow faster than the good plants and choke out the nice plants. And then sometimes you have really fertile soil, and that's where the beautiful things can grow. I'm going to talk to the adults and those of you who stay in here today about what I think Jesus meant when he was telling us this parable. But what I want to share with you is this recognition that things grow in all kinds of situations. We don't have to be perfect for God's love to grow in our lives, do we? Sometimes our hearts might feel like cracked concrete, but something can grow there. Sometimes there might be so many things going on in our lives and trying to keep our attention that we can't focus on God all the time, but things can still grow there. And then sometimes in our life, our hearts are just like the special dirt that I put in that flower pot, and God's love can grow there and create beautiful flowers. So I love this story because it tells us that things can grow if God plants them despite all odds. So let me offer a prayer for you that God's love would grow in your life, and then you can go on to whatever comes next for you this morning, okay? Let's pray. You want to hold hands? There's not too many of us. We can hold hands, right? Can you hold my hand? You want to hold hands with the fellow behind you? There. Yeah, hold their hands. Perfect. All right. Oh, God, I'm so grateful for each of these children. I'm thankful for their beautiful honesty. I'm thankful for the families that they represent and the way that your love is being sown and grown in their hearts. I'm thankful for the reminder, O Lord, that we do not have to be perfect for you to sow your seeds in us and for your love and your will to grow in our lives. Lord, I pray that whether we are in a rocky place or a dry place or in the weeds or filled with fertile soil, that the seeds of your love would take root in all of us, especially in these children, and grow abundantly. We pray this in your most holy name. Amen. Friends, let's stand up and let the congregation bless us. Congregation, bless your children. Thank you. All right. You think we're going this way to children and worship? There you go.
Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from Isaiah 53, where Isaiah speaks of the suffering and glory of the servant, beginning at verse 1, chapter 53, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our affirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will hear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made transgression for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
us hear now the parable of the sower from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and then the explanation in verses 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, but they had no depth of soil. So when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them out. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while, And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruits and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Thanks be to God for the reading of this word. In the spring of 2005, Matt and I bought our very first home. We were living in North Carolina at the time. I was finishing up divinity school, and we found a home in a lovely, newly developed subdivision just outside of Winston-Salem. It was a modest home, a three-bedroom ranch on a small lot, but the house was brand new. And there was something magical about being the first owners of a home. It had high ceilings and wide doorways, a big jetted tub in the master bathroom. It had beautiful off-white tile in the kitchen and wall-to-wall plush ivory carpet throughout the house. We quickly learned that some of those features that had stolen our hearts at first glance became the bane of our existence once we actually lived in the house. Who, who invented ivory carpet? <laughs> and especially who would put it in a house in North Carolina? I don't know if you've ever been to North Carolina, if you have seen the soil there, but it is like red clay, like this color. It is exactly the color of bricks. It's as hard as bricks. It's as dusty as brick dust, and it grows plants about as good as if you'd planted them in the midst of a pile of bricks. <laughs> it, especially it being in a new neighborhood where there was construction all around us, there was dirt everywhere. And any time it would rain, our dogs would find those bright red mud puddles and track all over our ivory tile, and our ivory carpet. Needless to say, the steam cleaner became my very best friend. And until my children are grown and our pets are gone, everything I now own is dirt-colored, depending on where we live. 
one of the first conversations that Matt and I had when we moved back to Iowa was just how different the soil was here. We would drive past freshly turned fields, and the ground was as black as midnight. You could almost see the nutrients shimmering on the surface. It was amazing that that clay that we endured in North Carolina could be part of the same land that makes up the United States when we drove and looked at the soil in Iowa. For many Iowans, the soil that surrounds us is their livelihood. Maybe some of you, that's your livelihood. What grows in those fields puts clothing on the backs of their families and food on the table and gas in the vehicles. And yet, these fields, as far as the eye can see... It just isn't enough, is it? I mean, there's still a hunger crisis in the United States. And I know so many farmers for whom one bad season of weather can interrupt and erase months or years or weeks or entire lifetimes of work and livelihood. Even now, when everything about the soil, when everything about the farming industry seems industrialized and genetically modified and mechanized, we are still at the mercy of the wind and the weather and the rain and the dirt. Jesus' parable of the sower still hits pretty close to home. I'm sure you've heard this parable a million times. You've probably learned it in Sunday school as a small child. And maybe you went home and planted seeds in all of the different kinds of soil to see what would really, gl- what would really grow. I'm sure that there have been many pastors who've tried to explain it to you and to make it relevant for your life. We even see that happening in the gospel itself. Those verses in 18 through 23 are the gospel writer's way of trying to help this parable make sense for us. Perhaps you've been taught or you've believed that the point of this parable was to challenge you to make sure that your life was fertile soil and fertile soil only. Maybe you've heard that this parable is proof that some people just aren't called to be Christians or they can't cut it in a life of faith. Maybe you've heard it preached that this parable is proof that those with rocky or shallow faith have no room in the kingdom of God. I could preach this parable for a month of Sundays and I'm pretty sure I'd never be able to capture the depth of Jesus' teaching But as I was preparing for our time together today, there were two things that jumped out at me about this parable that I had never thought of before. And it's profoundly changed the way that I interpret this passage. So let's think about these together. The first is that Jesus calls this the parable of the sower. This is not called the parable of the four soils. I've been doing this work for a really long time, but for some reason, that was an aha moment for me. It made me wonder if Jesus' teaching here had much, much, much less to do with the kind of soil that we might represent, and instead if this parable had much, much, much more to do with the character of God, the divine sower who takes the risk of sowing seeds among us regardless of our soil type. The brilliant and prolific pastor, preacher, and teacher, Barbara Brown Taylor, said this about today's parable. She says, like I have connected for you today, that her usual response to this parable is to hear it as a call to improve her life. So that if someone were to share this same parable about her, it would have a happier ending because she would be the fertile soil. But there's something wrong with that, she says, because Jesus doesn't call this the parable of the soils. 
Instead, Barbara continues, it's been known for centuries as the parable of the sower, which means that there's a good chance we've had it backwards all along. If we flip the switch and think about this story as an explanation of the character of the sower, if we recognize that this story is not about our own successes or failures, but instead it's about the extravagance of the sower who doesn't seem phased by daily concerns about what kind of soil the seed is falling on, this sower who just flings seeds everywhere, who wastes it with holy abandon, who feeds the birds and whistles at the rocks and picks his way through thorns and shouts hallelujah towards the good soil and then keeps on going. If we think that this sower is confident that there is enough seed to go around, that there's plenty for anyone who might want some, and that when the harvest comes at last, there will be enough to fill every barn in the neighborhood to the rafters. Taylor challenges us to consider that if this parable of the sower is not about the different kinds of ground, then it begins to sound quite new. What if this story is not about our shortfalls and instead about the generosity of our maker, the sower who doesn't obsess over the condition of the fields, who isn't stingy with the seeds, and who cares if the soil is good or bad? The sower isn't cautious. The sower isn't judgmental. In fact, this sower isn't even really very practical. The sower just seems to keep reaching into the bag and flinging seeds far and wide for all eternity. That changes things, doesn't it? At least it does for me. In his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we are saved by grace and not by anything that we can do of our own merit. There is no way that we can make our soil good enough to earn anything at any time or any place. This parable seems to bear witness to that, that God's extravagant love and welcome is what makes the difference. God's life-changing salvation is abundantly available to each and every one of us, those of us who've cultivated our lives so that this love can take root and flourish, and even on those of us who have no idea what to do with it and for whom the weeds of our past or the rocky mistakes that we've made threaten to snuff it out entirely. I am ordained by the United Church of Christ, as many of you know, and one of our mottos in that denomination is that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I can hear that motto in this parable. No matter if your soil is fertile or rocky or weedy or thorny thorny or dry, you are welcome in God's garden. The second thing that really stood out to me as I was reading through this parable again and again is that if we're honest with ourselves, there's a pretty good chance that at any point in our lives, there are multiple kinds of soils evident within us. We aren't perfect. We do have rocky histories and thorny personalities and dry, dry spirits. And yet God still sows love in each of us anyway. Elizabeth Johnson, who's a professor at the Lutheran Institute of Theology, says that it's noteworthy that nowhere in Jesus' teaching does he tell those who are listening, be good soil. That's not what Jesus wants of us in this passage. Instead, Johnson says that if there is any hope for the unproductive soil that is in all of us, it's that the sower keeps sowing generously and extravagantly, even in the least promising places. Professor Johnson reminds us and challenges us that as people called of God to continue 
the mission of the church, what are the implications of this parable for the work that we are called to do? How often do we play it safe? Taking our ministries, sowing the seeds of God, only where we're confident that it will be well received, where it might take root, where someone who engages with it might become an active member of our congregation. In the name of good stewardship, we hold tightly to our resources, wanting to be sure that we're not wasting a dime. We don't want to fling that money far and wide and not have any return on our investment. We stifle creativity and energy for mission, resisting new ideas for fear that it might not work. We don't want to fail. But Jesus' approach was entirely different. Jesus wasn't a play-it-safe kind of Savior. In this parable, Jesus gives us the freedom to take risks for the sake of the gospel. He endorses extravagant generosity that we should sow God's love, fling wide the seeds of our ministries, even in the most ridiculous and perilous of places. While this might not feel wise to us or even efficient, the miracle of the kingdom of God is that even in this generous abandon, Jesus promises that the end result will be a bumper crop. Perhaps the most important thing for us to take away from this parable is that God's work in us God's love sown in our lives, the ministry of God that we present to the world, works its way through the bumps and through the bruises, through the thorns and through the rocks, in the shadow of scavenging birds, through the threat of drought. And sometimes it even makes its way to fertile soil. And yet the promise remains true. God will bless it no matter where it falls. So here's the good news, my friends. Whether your life is rocky and thorny or dry and dusty like the North Carolina soil or rich and fertile like those Midwestern cornfields that surround us, the sower is tossing seeds our way. The unconditional love of God is available in abundance to each and every one of us. So may we receive it and nurture it and grow it and harvest it to the best of our ability, even if all we have to work with is a crack in the sidewalk. And may we share it with others as extravagantly, without question or pause, just as Jesus does, so that the kingdom of God might flourish right before our very eyes. Thanks be to God for the seeds of love that are sown in us. May we be generous sowers. Amen. Having heard this good news of the kingdom of God, I invite you to stand and let us confirm and affirm and say together what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We enter into a time now of prayers. 
for our community and our world. I invite you to dig deep into your hearts and think about those things, those places in your own life that need particular attention and offer them before the Lord as we pray. O holy God, for the blessing of this life, we give thanks to you for families and friends and colleagues and neighbors and strangers who nurture us, that the love of God may grow within, that your love, your word is like a seed, O Lord, and we pray that it would grow to produce in us good fruit. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. O Lord, we pray for the leaders of various nations and cities, including our own, that they may lead with strong hearts and gentle hands and generous spirits, with compassion and mercy and wisdom and grace. May your will guide their actions and decisions. We pray that your love, even there, would be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. O Lord, we pray for all of those who serve in harm's way, those who live in dangerous places, those who live in areas of war and strife, those who live in fear, those who worry about employment and bills and food, those who struggle just to find dignity in life. May your grace bring peace and safety to all people, one to another. May your love be like a seed in these places and situations, taking root and growing strong. For those who suffer from any illness or disease or dis-ease of mind or body and spirit, including those within our own congregation, for whom should we pray? Restore to all of these, O Lord, and those we carry within our hearts to the fullness of health, allowing them to be healthy as only you, O Lord, can bring. May your mercy shower each of us with healing mercy and love. And in these situations and in these people, may your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. We pray especially, O Lord, for those who are dying and for those who have died. We pray that you would send forth your comforting love. Give their families solace to mourn. Console those who grieve. And may your grace surround us like a mantle upon our heads and a shawl upon our shoulders, that we might be a hand to one another, supporting and comforting each other as we mourn. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong in these places. And especially, O Lord, for the work of this congregation, for the ministries and classes, for the ways that we are doing our best to sow your seeds of love throughout this community, one sack lunch at a time, one afternoon weeding the community garden at a time one Bible study at a time, one mission trip at a time, one recovery trip at a time. In all of these places, may your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. And we live in the full hope that these seeds will grow your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And we are mindful to pray as Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are called to be generous givers. This is one more way that we can sow seeds of God's love 
into this community and into God's work in the world. So please give as you are led to do so. divine sower, from the abundance of our lives, we bring our gifts before you today, praying, Lord, that you may sow the seeds on all of our soils daily, and that our roots may go deep into the soil of your love, and that we may begin to feel and understand how long, how wide, how deep, and how high your love for us is. Yes, Lord, we come in gratitude, and we bless your holy name. Amen.
prepare to leave this place, it is my sincere hope that you would go now and speak boldly of what you have seen of God's glory. Do not cling tightly to the seeds of faith as if there is not enough to go around. But instead, as the Lord lives, listen to Christ and follow him. From the places of revelation to the places of mission, sowing far and wide, without care or concern, the seeds of God's holy love. And may God shine the light of glory on your hearts. May Christ be with you and never leave you. And may the Holy Spirit renew the image of God that is within you and within everyone you meet. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.